the Persian people once again welcome. We, uh, I am uh, personally very honored, and, and on behalf of CAN and Education Department, I am very, very happy to receive you today. Thank you uh, to be with us despite your busy schedule. Uh, just a quick reminder well. about your biography. Uh, in, uh, all the members know you well, but just a quick reminder, you are Associate Professor of Political Ethics at Kyle and teaches the history of religion and philosophy of religion at, at the Faculty of Islamic Studies. Um, uh, your academic interests are diversified and include Islamic political thoughts and ethics, religious reform and sectarian history of Muslim societies, especially relationship, relationship between Sunni and Shia. Um, you hold uh, uh, in 2011 a PhD in the history of religion from Texas about the crusades impact on Sunni Shia uh, relations. This very interesting work have been already translated in Turkish in 2012 and into Arabic um, in 2015. And before you taught Tafsir and Arabic grammar uh, in Yemen, in uh, University of uh, in Yemen University, and also in uh, America, at the American Open University when you moved to USA. Uh, you are a regular contributor to Al Jazeera TV channel and website, uh, where we you published many hundreds of articles, and you are a good follower and observer of the current population movements for freedom accompanying the Arabic Spring. And last but not least, you are father of four children, Iman, Hajj, Rashid, and very recently, Malik. Uh, welcome <laughs> Thank you. with us. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, welcome with, uh, Allah. Welcome once again. Uh, inshallah, after, after <coughs> your presentation for maybe 30 minutes, Sister Zainab will, will moderate the the debate for uh, uh, for uh, one hour and one hour and a half. Uh, uh, it depends of the of the time of uh, of our our brothers and sisters. Barakallah feek and uh, I let you inshallah start the your presentation. Barakallah Yeah, Barakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Jazakumullah khair and may Allah bless all of you for this uh, initiative. I'm very glad, very honored to be with you today talking about this very complicated issue that is causing a lot of trouble, shedding a lot of blood nowadays, uh, unfortunately. Very old and very new, chronic and new problem, which is the sectarian problem of Sunni and Shia uh, divide. So the title is the Shia Expansion Phenomenon, History, Logic, and Manifestations. And as the, the brother said in the introduction, very generous introduction, is Allah uh, khair. I will try to put this problem into a historical perspective. Uh, there are a lot of in, in common between Sunnis and Shia, and there are a lot of differences. Uh, if, if we talk about it theoretically in terms of theology, history, and political theory, these are the main, or maybe we can also talk about sources. The, the commonalities between Sunnis and Shia are that the two groups are Muslims. Uh, both of them believe in the main articles of Islamic faith. Both of them practice the five pillars of Islam. So I, I believe that is a very huge space for commonality here. But there are also very serious differences between the two. And those differences are theological, ritual, and also there are some differences in political theory, interpretation of Islamic history, and sources. In terms of theology, the main difference is about the imama, which is well connected also to the political theory. For Sunnis, who are the majority of Muslims, political leadership is just civil service. It's not has 
has no theological position at all. It, has, uh, it should be elected leadership, accountable to the people who elect this leadership. There is nothing sacred about it, nothing mysterious about it. While the uh, Shia imama theory, which is both theological and political theory, is much more, uh, the, the, imam, the imams are sacred leaders. Practically, they are a continuation of the prophethood. Because unlike what in the Sunnah believe that the interpretive authority of Islam is in the hand of all Muslims, or ijma consensus. For the Shia, no, the, the, the interpretive authority of the religious text is in the hand of the imams. Or, based on the new theory of Wilayat al baqi in the hand of the deputies of the imam. And that's when the Wilayat al baqi starts. Uh, the, in in terms of interpretation of Islamic history, there is a very huge gap between Sunnis and Shia, and very sensitive. And actually, my historical studies of the development of Sunni-Shia relations throughout Islamic history, the most sensitive issue that caused confrontations between the two groups was mo mostly about interpretation of the uh, of the of early Islam, especially what. Sunnis believe about Sahaba and what the Shia believe about Sahaba. Uh, the other point of difference is about the sources. Also, Sunni and Shia believe in Quran as the sacred book, but the, their sources in, in terms of Sunnah are completely different. So the main sources in Sunnism, like Bukhari, Muslim, and Sunan Tirmidhi, Sunan Ibn Majah, Musnad Ahmad, etc., what we call Kutub al Tisad, nine books, are not recognized by the Shia as a source of Islamic faith or Islamic law or Islamic ethics. They have their own books, and those books are uh, different uh, in terms of content and different also in terms of historical uh, collection and development. Uh, and uh, they have some books like like Malah Baru al Waqil ibn Babawi, and other books. Uh, we don't need to go much about about it. Uh, so, but uh, I, I think with all of these theological differences, there still be a way, a possibility of coexistence between Shia and Sunnah. And actually, that's what happened throughout Islamic history. Most in most of Islamic history, there was there was some coexistence between Sunni and Shia from the beginning of Islam until today. And uh, in my study, I found only four instances of disconnection between Sunni and Shia. Most of the time, there are connection and coexistence, but there are four instances of time of intense relation and disconnect, almost complete disconnection between the two denominations over the two groups. The first one was when the Shia have, uh, or when the Shia created the Fatimid state in Qairawan in Tunisia, and that was in the, in the third century of Hijra, ninth century, the Gregorian era. And the, the Fatimid state had a very bloody confrontation with the Sunni Maliki population of Qairawan and Tunisia in general, and later on also with the population of Egypt when the uh, Fatimid ex extended eastward toward Egypt and Syria. That was the first instance of disconnection and constant confrontations, ideological and political and sometimes military confrontations between Sunnis and Shia. The second historical example uh, took place in Baghdad during the Buyid state. The Buyid state, al Buwayhiyun in Arabic, uh, was a state created in Baghdad. There was a sultan, the, the Khalifa was Sunni, 
Abbas Khalifa, but the Sultan, who is the military leader, was uh, and the and the Wazir was Shia, and the 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 way he state actually was the state under which the Shia uh, doctrine was developed into a clear uh, uh, vision, a clear law, and something separate completely from Sunnism. Uh, under the support and with the support of the Bawahi state, which uh, the Bawahi controlled Baghdad 105 years uh, in the 10th and 11th century, from 944 to about uh, 1055. Uh, under the, uh, the surveillance of the, of the Buehi and support of the Buehi, uh, most of the, the, the foundational sources of the, of, of the Shia doctrine and jurisprudence, uh, the, the foundational text was, were written at that time, the text of Ibn Babawai, Tosi and other Shia scholars. Uh, the, the, the Sunni foundational texts have been written before, sometimes before, like the books of Bukhari and Muslim and others. Uh, these were in the 3rd century. But for the Shia, I was in the 5th uh, Hijra century. And that was under the, uh, the Boehi authority and support of Boehi authority. Anyway, the, this is the second instance of disconnection. During the Boehi uh, era, Muslims and, and, and Shia were confronting each other almost on a daily basis in Baghdad. And there are a lot of confrontation. I talk about this in my book on this crusade impact on Sunni Shia relations, and you can read it in any chronicle of Islamic history talking about Baghdad in the, in the 11th century, 5th century of Israel. The third instances of historical, of uh, political and uh, cultural disconnection between Sunni and Shia is the clash between the Fatawid state and the Ottoman state. The Safavid state was created in Iran, was born in Iran in 1501, about 500 years ago. Before that, Iran actually was a Sunni by majority. The population of Iran was Sunni. The Persian was Sunni. In the first nine centuries of Islam, Persian was Sunni. The Safavid family, who was Turkish originally, not Persian, they came from uh, Azerbaijan, they controlled Iran, and they imposed uh, Shiism by force with the help of some Fuqaha and scholars, Shia Fuqaha and scholars who came from Lebanon. So uh, the, the, the Safavid were, uh, uh, the Safavid, after they created their state, they entered into very bloody confrontation with the Ottoman Empire in Iraq, in southern Syria, and in eastern Anatolia. And that was very, very effective in weakening the Ottoman Empire and stopping the Ottoman expansion in Europe. The fourth instance of disconnection is what we live today and started with the Iranian Revolution in 1979 and the Iraqi-Iran War from 1981 to 1988. And we're still living under this problem today. So there are two points here that, uh, that really uh, I feel that they are most important, more important than any differences between Sunni and Shia. In my study to the Shia history and culture, I found that two problems are making the coexistence with Sunnis very difficult. Two phenomena in Shia culture. One of them I called in Arabic al-Zakir al mawtura or vengeful memory. The historical memory of the Shia is very vengeful, and uh, it's, uh, it's about revenge, it's about taking revenge. There are a lot of cultural institutions, religious institutions, even uh, some ritual activities like uh, like Ta'ziyah and 
uh, crying all the time over the death of Imam Hussein and Ahl al-Bayt. All, all of this is creating some uh, psychological, uh, psychological, you know, situation that is uh, uh, like pushing people, pushing the Shia to ask for revenge, to take revenge whenever it's possible. This is very serious, a psychological, cultural issue that I think has not been given enough attention by the scholars and researchers who are studying Shiism. Maybe one exception is the Dr. Ali Wardi, who is an Iraqi sociologist and who is also who belongs to a Shia family. He's the one who actually, the only one I found who talk about this deeply uh, in his psychological and sociological analysis of Shiism. In his book, Wa'al al-Salatin, and, and uh, his other book, Shakhsiyat al-Rajul al-Iraqi, he talks about this phenomenon. The second phenomenon in Shia culture that make, uh, makes coexistence very difficult is also what I call in Arabic al-Mantiq al-Hilali, or the replacement logic. There is a tendency in Shiism, or political Shiism in general, to expand at the expense of the rest of the ummah. You know, it's very, uh, it's very amazing how uh, in, in time of empire where Muslim empire were fighting non-Muslim empire, Muslim empire trying to expand uh, uh, in, the other, in the land of other empires, non-Muslim empires. Uh, this is the logic that we've, we find in most of the Islamic history. But the Shia has a different characteristic in this. Uh, the, for the Shia, the enemy is within, is not outside. The expansion should be inside the Muslim Ummah, not outside the Muslim Ummah. They don't care much about expanding their realm politically when they were time of conquest and empire. Uh, they didn't take, they didn't, uh, they didn't, uh, care much about ex even spreading Islam in other nations who are not Muslims. Their problem is with the majority of Muslims, how they can expand within uh, the majority of Muslims, within the Islamic land. And there are many examples. Uh, for example, again, if we talk, if we go back to the four instances of this connection between Shiism and Sunnism, when the Fatimid Empire was born in, in Qairawan, Tunisia, in the third century of Hijra. By the logic of Islamic history and the conquest that was dominant in Islamic history, you know, one should expect the Fatimid Empire to expand northward towards Europe or southward towards Africa. But that did not happen. The, empire, the, the Fatimid Empire expand eastward inside the, the Islamic world itself. They, 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 conquer, they conquer Egypt, which was an Islamic land, and then they conquer part of Syria. They took Damascus several times, Aleppo several times. They even controlled Baghdad for one year during the revolt of al basir Syria, who was a Turkish military leader who uh, became Shia, and, and they controlled Baghdad in the, in, in, on behalf of the Fatimid for one year at least. So the Fatimid was, uh, were trying to reconquer the Islamic world instead of conquering non-Islamic land. Uh, also, this same thing happened with the Safavid uh, Empire. Instead of expanding their empire northward toward Russia, for example, Eastern Europe, or, or east, eastward toward China, for example, they didn't do that. They attacked the the, uh, the Ottomans in Iraq, northern Syria, and eastern Anatolia. And uh, their problem were, was always trying to expand uh, in the Ottoman land, not on non-Muslim land. And I think what Iran is doing today is, is uh, very compatible with this historical pattern. Iran is, is not spreading Islam outside the Islamic world is not doing much about spreading Islam anywhere. It's just trying to expand its own political 
real and political influence within the Muslim countries neighboring Iran, especially in the Arab world. And what we see Iran doing in Iraq, in Syria, in, in Lebanon, in Yemen, is, uh, I think is very uh, compatible with this historical pattern, pattern that I noticed in Shia history in, in general. So if, if we want to understand the Shia expansion or expansionalism today, let me go back to the, to the title, the Shia expansion phenomenon. If we want to understand the Shia expansion phenomenon, I think we have to look at this history uh, and see how the Fatimids expand to Egypt, Syria, how the Safavids expand to Iraq, and Syria, and how uh, and what Iran is doing today is is just following the same steps. So, what we're going to do about this? What is our ethical responsibility today as Muslims and as human beings? We see the blood uh, flowing every day in this in this clash. I think the Quranic principles are very clear. If there is an aggression from a Muslim group against another group, whether it's Sunni or Shia, it doesn't matter, whether it's in between two human groups who are, Muslim, who are not Muslim. The principle is very clear. The principle is to try to, uh, to achieve some reconciliation between the two. That's what we read in Surah Al-Hujurat. وَإِن طَائِفَتَانِ مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ اقْتَتَلُوا فَأَصْلِحُوا بَيْنَهُمَا If two groups of the believers start fighting each other, you should try to reconcile them. The imbalati hdarma al ukhra fakatilulati tabai. If if one of them is committing the aggression against the other, so you need to fight this the aggressor until it accepts reconciliation. And then after that, when they accept reconciliation, then you you try to go back to the reconciliation based on the principles of justice and fairness. That is the Islamic principle that Muslims have to do every time and in every uh, case where Muslims are fighting other Muslims. So, uh, of, of course, the Shia suffer from Sunni uh, injustices sometimes. And uh, the, the Iraqi, actually, Iran war was initiated by Iraq, not by, the, but by Iran, as we know, in September 18, uh, 1981, when Iraqi army invaded Iran. Uh, and Iraq was the aggressor at the time, at least at the beginning of the war. And the responsibility of Muslims at the time was to stop Iraq from attacking Iran. Unfortunately, that didn't happen. What happened is that some Arab countries, Muslim countries, were supporting uh, Iraq, and there are also others, uh, like, like uh, Assad Syria, was supporting Iran. Uh, and then, when 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 Iraq accepted reconciliation, Iran refused reconciliation, and they refused the ceasefire uh, that was that was proposed by the United Nations for several years. They were refusing it until Iran was about to. Uh, just to to finish, then Khomeini decided in 1989, 1988 to accept peace uh, and ceasefire with Iraq. Okay, this is what happened in the past. What's happening today is the opposite. It's Iran that is committing injustices. Shia, not only Iran, actually. It's a Shia phenomenon. It's not an Iranian phenomenon. If it was only an Iranian phenomenon, we can read it within the the, the logic of nationalistic uh, wars and nationalistic conflict. But it's not really a simple Iranian political expansion. It is a Shia transnational expansion and aggression. And Iran is, is, was able to mobilize everyone who has anything to do with Shiism, whether he's Imami or he's Alawi, like the Syrian Alawis, or Zaidi, like the Yemeni Houthis. Um, you know, historically, the Zaydis have nothing to do with Imamism. Uh, the Alawis also was historically seen by both Sunni and Shia, not Muslim at all. 
But Iran is using now anyone who has anything, any sort of affiliation with Shiism to attack uh, other Muslim countries. And I think, uh, I, I, I deeply believe that there is no way, no other way other than coexistence between Sunnism and Shiism. I believe that in principle that there is no coercion in religion like Rahav al-Din. And the Shia should be recognized to follow what they believe in their rituals, uh, in their faith, in their worship, without any restriction. Uh, same for Sunnis. Uh, but I think what we have today is, is just pure aggression. And every Muslim today have to stop the Shia aggressors. reconciliation, then they have to be treated based on the principles of justice and fairness. Uh, there is no other alternative other than coexistence, but coexistence cannot be achieved if a country is expanding in other countries and sending militia to fight in other countries, supporting bloody dictators. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.